We are live here at, where are we? Where are we guys? <laughs> B&H B &H event space. space. All right, the B&H photo event space. My name is Gabriel. I'm joined here by Matt Hill hey, and buddy. Lance Kymick. Um, and we are national parks. We're three fifths of national parks at night. Chris, 60%. 60%, right? Chris Nicholson is also in the room right now, uh, but unfortunately he is suffering from a non-night photography related injury. Um, so he cannot speak with us today, but he will be joining us for our processing uh, talk tomorrow. So just to give you sort of the kickoff to the intro outline of what, what to expect here, uh, this is the last um, official event of Optic 2018. So I wanna thank you all for coming and being part of uh, Optic. How many of you guys uh, have been to all of the events at Optic? <laughs> all right, how many of you have been to most of the events at Optic? All right, awesome, awesome. And if those of you who don't know what Optic is, go to www.optic2018.com. Um, and that's been a wonderful little collection of uh, wildlife, outdoors, travel photographers that have been speaking the last few days. Um, and it usually happens the first week, uh, the first Sunday through Wednesday, Thursday of June every year and is put on by B&H and many of their friends. So uh, we're glad to be part of that. We're glad that the night photography is uh, gonna be talked about as a, a, a wonderful solution uh, and a way to see and interpret your uh, travels. And um, so we, this class is really, we're doing three things. So I'll, just so you're all aware uh, of it, we're having our talk here tonight, today from four to 6 p.m. And this talk is really an inspirational talk about how we can kind of see beyond the Milky Way. Milky Way images have saturated the night photography market. And uh, it seems like that's the, what everyone thinks of night photography is Milky Way shots. So we're gonna show you that there's more to that. So as Gabe said, we're gonna talk about night photography and photographing or exploring the night beyond the Milky Way. Um, night photography itself has become increasingly popular as technology advances and it evolves. Um, and also the you know with the world of social media and, and more, us being exposed to more and more images, different kinds of images from different places. Um, but uh, light photography has been a thing for a very long time. It's been around for a long time, it's, but it's evolving very quickly. And Matt recently came up with the uh, the notion that this is the golden age of night photography, and I, th I think it is. And Hopefully, through this presentation today, you'll you'll see some of the many facets of uh, different types of night photography. But we are, as Gabe said, National Parks at Night. Chris Nicholson, Matt Hill, Gabe Biederman, Tim Cooper, and myself. I'm Lance Keimig, and we teach night photography workshops in national parks and other exciting locations around the world. That's what we came together to do, and it's what our, our passion really is all about. So um, you can follow our uh, weekly blog on the website, National Parks at Night, and also uh, connect through social, various social media outlets. But anyway, let's get on to the presentation here. And uh, as I mentioned, night photography goes way back nearly to the beginning of the history of night photography. Um, and uh, there are examples of night photography from early daguerreotypes um, all the way up through the digital age. But technology has always been the, the greatest limitation to night photography. Um, we are kind of been pushing the limits of what's, what's possible based on contemporary technology. Early uh, photographic processes were very limited in terms of light sensitivity and it was difficult, if not impossible, to do really long exposures, um, record images in, in, in ways that we can today. So um, this is a Brassai up here, uh, yeah. one of the famous first, night pho first photographers who was really known and famous for night photography. But throughout the history of night photography, photographers have always found one way or another to make it work. But um, here is shown the uh, uh, Carlos and Miguel Vargas, two Peruvian brothers who 
were real pioneers of early night photography techniques. Um, their work is not all that well known, but they really did make a major contribution um, in terms of staged photography at night and added uh, light or light painting, as well as combining long exposures with added light. So they're real pioneers in the, in the world of night photography. But what's been the, the missing piece for up until quite recently was the ability to photograph stars and the Milky Way as points of light. That's kind of the, the holy grail of night photography is to be able to record the Milky Way in images. And um, it's only been in the last uh, five, five to six, seven years that it's been possible because of advances in photography the ability to shoot at higher ISOs and do exposures that are short enough to preserve the, star, the stars without showing the motion of the Earth's rotation. So, um, but now everybody wants to photograph the Milky Way. Everybody is photo photographing the Milky Way and, and star point images. Um, that is everyone who gets out of New York City because <laughs> <laughs> you don't really see it here. You're lucky if you see the North Star or, or uh, anything else here. But so um, one of the uh, um, downsides of Milky Way photography and the and the explosion of popularity is that we kind of lose track of all of the other things that. Uh, we have all the other types of photography that we can do, all the other places that we can photograph, and all the different ways to seize the night, as Gabe likes to say. All right, so um, beyond the Milky Way. All right. beyond, the, beyond the Milky Way, photographing in nature is normally where most people will go to do these star point or Milky Way images, but um, when the when the galactic core of the Milky Way is in hiding below the horizon, there's still plenty to plenty to be done. Um, our national parks are an amazing, fantastic resource and provide great locations for all types of night photography, um, as well as up and up and above and beyond the Milky Way. So, um, within the parks, you can find lots of different photographic opportunities, whether, whether it's sand dunes or mountains, volcanoes, coastlines, lakes, and deserts, um, anything, so, so much more. Most, most of the parks provide dark enough skies for photographing uh, the Milky Way, um, but you could also do long exposures, star trail images. This is uh, Redwood National Park. Some more star trails in Olympic National Park in Washington. <coughs> North Cascades <coughs> National Park by moonlight. And Redwood by moonlight. With the, you can see the fog down below, the, the Pacific Coast fog down, down below. Um, there's always an opportunity to make something happen. It doesn't matter where you are, what you know, what you think you want to <coughs> photograph may or may not be a, a, an option, but you can always make something happen. On, on the night when this was taken, um, it was very difficult to photograph underneath of this dense fog. So, look for an option. I just drove up the mountains, and and then it's the spectacular vista looking down over the uh, over the Pacific Ocean and the, the fog belt there. Um, light painting is always fun no matter where you are. There are always opportunities to light, whether it's uh, man-made structures like this or uh, natural formations, light painting is a fun and, and uh, creative aspect of night photography. Weather. Weather is another, uh, provides all, another opportunity for fun and interesting and sometimes dangerous night photography. This is uh, Great Sand Dunes National Park in, in Colorado. So, um, what about outside of natural areas? Other, other types of night photography, 
Um, well, Gabe is going to talk to us about photographing urban and cityscape night photography. And Matt will talk about portraiture and photographing people at night. And then one of uh, my favorite night photography subjects is photographing in <coughs> industrial areas. They uh, really provide uh, very interesting and unique opportunities for photography. Where is that? Let me go on there. I don't want to back up the slide. I lost the track. Yeah. Was. All right. It was Boston. It was yeah. Boston, I think. Okay. Um, all right. One of the uh, one of my early inspirations was Jan Stoller. Um, he's a, uh, a native New Yorker who did an amazing project called Frontier in New York. In uh, publishes a book called Frontier in New York in the mid 1970s, and he photographed in the uh, in kind of the urban wastelands on the edges of New York. Uh, really remarkable work. So. Jan Stoller. Great, uh, great uh, plane trail. Yep, <laughs> it's one of the one of the few times when a plane trail actually makes the image better rather yeah. than than yeah. ruining it there. So two, he published two books of industrial night photography around New York, uh, frontier New York, and on planet Earth. So hit, that work was uh, some of the inspiration for my early explorations of uh, urban environments around and, and industrial environments around. San Francisco Bay Area, where I went to school. Um, what um, you know, it's lighting is one of the things that's combined with strange places and strange equipment that really make uh, industrial areas prime for for night shooting. So um, yeah, it's all about mixed lighting and just strange, weird places that you very unexpected. Um, this is a combination of mercury vapor and sodium vapor lights, and, and where they come together and overlap just, just creates really interesting colors. So, um, One of the real challenges about industrial night photography is getting access to permission and permission to photograph in places or not getting kicked out of places. Um, you know, in the post 9 11 world, uh, things change dramatically for us as photographers and, and somehow it always seems that um, you know when you go out at night you're a, a target for suspicion you know Sus I think um, I, I've never understood why uh, a photographer out at night is such a strange and, and scary thing to so many <laughs> authorities but, but for some reason it is um, although I will say that one of the plus sides of the increased popularity of night photography is that it's become so commonplace that we're not as uh, scary. Yeah, we're not as scary as we used to. <laughs> misunderstood, so, perhaps. Yeah. yeah this, that's it, the misunderstood artist. All right. So mixed lighting, uh, again, as I mentioned, is one of the main things about photographing in industrial sites that make night photography an interesting place to go. So lots of different artificial light sources, sodium vapor, mercury vapor, uh, and when you, metal halide lights, tungsten, neon, fluorescent, all of them many, uh, many of times in the same scene. And when you've got more than one light source in the same situation, that's when things get interesting because you can choose your white balance based on one or the other. You could try to eliminate or minimize color shifts but eh, where's the fun in that? I, I think when you've got this image that you're looking at here doesn't have any added light and there's not, uh, you know, this is basically how the image appeared on the back of my camera. Of course, you can modify the colors um, any way that you like. This is simply one of uh, the new profiles in, in Lightroom, uh, just tweaking those colors a little bit and cha changing the nature of them. Um, if that's not your thing, you can mute the colors. You can take some of the color saturation out and go for a more natural or more realistic look. And if you can't stomach the crazy colors at all, well, there's always black and white. <laughs> and, um, you know, I, I started primarily as a black and white film photographer, so that was kind of a natural thing for me to photograph these industrial areas in, 
in black and white, especially when you only have one strong monochromatic light source, like sodium vapor, where it's really saturated orange and everything has this kind of yucky orange-brown glow to it. In situations like that, it, to me, it calls for black and white conversions. Um, but oftentimes, when I go out to shoot, I'm looking for those mixed lighting situations where you've got two different light sources or more coming from different directions. Maybe they overlap or maybe they're completely separated. It just like, makes for a lot of possibilities. Uh, um, so in natural environments, you typically have to make, often have to make the light with added lighting. Uh, starlight or moonlight is relatively even, consistent, flat, but in these urban areas you get some really crazy uh, com light combinations. And also really weird locations that make for interesting shapes, lines, and patterns, different things to uh, photograph. So this is a waste treatment plant in Boston, and it's just full of oppor photographic opportunities. Day, day and night. It's also full of smells, but uh, <laughs> strangely enough, if you can believe it or not, they made actually a park around the, the, the grounds. So this is Deer Island Waste Treatment Plant in Boston, and it's a, it's a park. <laughs> Only cool. certain areas are stinky. <laughs> so, um, yeah, that, there are just so many interesting things to photograph. And, out, out there at night in places that we don't usually go. If you wander off into the hinterlands outside of your familiar neighborhoods, you wander into all kinds of strange things like this. Um, this, is, this is in Boston. This one, um, this is in uh, Providence, Rhode Island. Um, and one of the things about phot photographing in an urban area that you don't get out in nature are these spontaneous quick changing situations. Um, you know, normally night photography is kind of a slow and methodical working process. You know, you're on a tripod, you're setting up, you're doing long exposures, you're, you know, you're going back and forth, making changes to your images. But every once in a while, and especially in an urban environment, something happens quickly, like this car pulls up behind the, uh, the, the white light on the, on the ground and on the back of this SUV is a car headlights coming up from behind. And it had just stopped there for a minute. I was, I had been set up waiting to photograph this uh, power plant and these cars stopped there, the, the SUV and the one behind it. And it was just a, a brief moment, lasted long enough for me to take a, about a 10 second exposure and then it was gone. And I did the photograph the uh, power plant that I'd originally set up to do with that glow inside the window there. Uh, textile mills. Uh, many of the textile mills around New England have been or are in the process of being rehabbed or renovated or turned into condos. Um, if you can get to them before they're converted, they're typically more photogenic. Also scarier and more dangerous and all that and more fence climbing. But um, this one here, um, I photographed this mill in Lawrence, Massachusetts. Uh, over a, a couple of year period during the time it was being uh, rehabbed and turned into uh, loft spaces. And it was more fun before they, they started cleaning it up. Um, so yeah, it's light. It's all about mixed lighting, different light sources coming from different directions here. And occasionally there you have opportunities to add light. Uh, in this case, the orange light on the uh, on the back on the right-hand side there is sodium vapor light, and there's a metal halide light on the left side of the frame and light the lighting up the uh, the tall structure in the background. But the uh, the light in the window that was me, adding just uh, adding some LED flashlight, bouncing it off the inside of this space there. It was just the right thing to uh, add some punch to that part of the image, and I I think it it made it. Uh, come to life there. So a couple more examples of mill images. And um, this is all existing light, ambient light, uh, no added light. Sodium vapor, 
that orange stripe is that sodium vapor. So imagine if the whole scene was lit with that sodium vapor light, right? It would just be overwhelmingly orange and not very interesting. Black and white is the way to go. But when you've got multiple light sources and just a little touch of it, it's really cool. So, all right, here is uh, another example of some added light or light painting. The, the reddish light on the background building is sodium vapor again. There's um, metal halide light on the building in the foreground. And then I'm around the corner with an LED flashlight shining that bluish light through. So um, lots and lots of opportunities. So um, a recent project of mine that I've been working on for the last couple of years was inspired by driving by this gravel pit. Um, it, was, it was on the way to the gym where I was going to, to work out a couple of times a week. And I kept driving by and seeing these weird formations that reminded me of Death Valley. Mm. This, is like, this is like the landscape in Death Valley. And here it is in Plymouth, Massachusetts, driving by there, seeing that. And I thought, well, that's really cool. But, you know, there's probably security and high fences and, you know, all kinds of reasons not to stop. It's cold, <coughs> it's dark, blah, blah, blah. And eventually I just decided, what the heck, let's, let's go check it out. And I found this surreal wonderland of opportunity for, for night photography. Um, this was the first image that I made in that series. And um, I went with a, uh, a friend of mine, uh, uh, who's another night photographer in Boston, a fellow named Jürgen Lobert. And Jürgen amused me to no end by taking deciding that he wanted to take a walk out on this quicksand, basically. And he quickly sunk up to his knees. But uh, we both got good shots that night. So, all right. Um, one of my photographic uh, mentors and inspirations has long been Michael Kenna, a pretty well-known black and white landscape photographer. And some of his early work at the, uh, the Rouge Motor Plant in Detroit kind of reminded me of, of this image and some of these locations in the, in the gravel pit. So I'm always going back to images that I've seen, um, whether they're contemporary or historical, what other people have done before. I've, I've certainly informed my own work through, through other people's images. You know, I, I don't, I don't want to copy what other people have done, but I've certainly learned from it. And, uh, this, this place, this location, really reminded me of uh, a lot of Michael's work. Is this digital? These are digital images. Um, the first two color images that I showed you were from the uh, early 1990s in, in uh, San Francisco, but this is, this is digital work. Yep, yeah, it's just a, a full-frame DSLR. Yeah. All right, so um, it's just piles of dirt but it provided so many different opportunities, shapes, lines, patterns, shadows. Um, I photographed here probably 20 different times over a period of uh, two years or so. And it's always changing. It's always different. Every time I'd go back, it was, there was some, something that I, one shot that I just didn't quite get the way I wanted it, I wanted to go back and shoot it. The whole pile of dirt, the whole mountain is gone. Mm -hmm. But there's something else to shoot, so it, it's uh, really a, a kind of a cool opportunity. All right. Did you have permission? Oh yeah. So as it turned out, nobody wants to steal dirt. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so there's no fences. There's no security guard. Nothing. I just like never. This is the only place I've ever been so many times and never run into anyone else. Hey, security. Wow. That was. Um, so yeah, you're. Go to your local gravel yard and <laughs> <laughs> you might find uh, opportunities like, like this one. But, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not everybody's thing, you know. Some, some people would rather be in a more familiar environment. Um, so with that in mind, let's move over All right, we're to gonna Mr. Biederman. Slide the, uh, the jammer, the computer down. Okay. 
one thing I think that one of the reasons why that we form National Parks at Night and, and, and looking at a lot of Lance's work there is one of the important things is also when you're photographing at night is to photograph with friends, you know, bring someone out. You never know, even a, right, you know, on Broadway or, you know, 7th Avenue, it's just the camaraderie ship. And that's where we, all of us were kind of lone wolf shooters. You know, uh, Matt and I, uh, found out we had a love for Matt, very uh, a love for a love for me. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, absolutely, a love for the night. <laughs> he loved Matt, and I loved him too. But um, but we had a love for the night, and so finding those people that obviously have the similar likes and going out there and joining the meetup group, going out on a workshop, you know, and and doing that together, whether it's the day or the night, I think it just makes you know that camaraderie ship and that re and and the experience better. And also, I love just seeing the images from everyone. You know, at, at the end of it, because there's always, you know, images like I didn't see that. How do you, you know, this, that, you know, and that, and that's why that's really kind of where the workshop experience kind of came from, and that's a, just a wonderful when you can spend three to five plus days, you know, experiencing that with a small group. Um, you'll really come away with a wonderful stories, you know, of that location. So, um, right. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about the urban. Uh, a little bit easier uh, night photographers, especially for New Yorkers. A lot of these images will be from New York, San Francisco, and so the other cities and places uh, that I've been. And um, it's a little, obviously, a little, a little bit more accessible to you, you know. And if it just means bringing your tripod with you to work, you know, um, I always love the winter time. The winter time and the fall are the best times for night photographers because when we get out of work, it's dark, it's ready, it's twilight. You know, summertime, which we're getting, you know, now we have to wait till like. 9 30 10 whatever you know so it's like we can well we might go home and not get, lose our motivation but i love you know going out there in those earlier uh in, the, in those uh earlier night times and that way you can be done by 10 o'clock um so uh, my, my uh program is called the city never sleeps and you know we kind of talked about star trails a little bit um and star trails used to be the old wow before the milky way became attainable um but again, using them both, not relying on one too much, you know, one all the time, you know, having that variety of that portfolio of the location of the night or wherever you go, just again, tells a better story. So this is, uh, I'm up here, this is uh, the LA and, and the suburbia of Los Angeles. Um, in the distance, I'm in the San Gabriel Mountains. And when you want to, you can actually capture star trails over some cities, New York City, little bit of, an, of, of a, an exception though you know I'm definitely inspired now to kind of try it some more but the the factors you got to look at are um, how dark is it so going out on a uh, you know when there's less of a moon it doesn't have to be a moonless night but it could be like 30 40 percent uh, moon you know so you know the moon does you know blow out some of the stars but this right here this is a six hour uh, exposure or six hour combined exposure. This was probably uh, four minute combinations that I ran for basically from when I set it up and then I woke up at like six in the morning and had the last like 20 of the images blown out because the light started, uh, right, the, the uh, twilight started happening. And then I combined them uh, together in Photoshop. The key to doing a picture like this is you want to really expose for the city lights right because we don't want those to blow out so you figure balancing that exposure for that as we call it light pollution you know coming that that yellow all that sodium vapor light from the city exposing for that and seeing how long of a star trail you can get and then taking a series of them that you can stack together no camera is capable really of exposing for six hours your battery will die you know before that happens you know, maybe you can get an hour or two, but really best techniques, and we'll talk a little bit about star stacking, you know, tomorrow in our processing class. So this was my image, it's about a year or two old, you know, but I loved it. This is my longest star trail to date. Um, but you can see how low those stars go. They really kind of go into that, really go fairly low. At least those bright stars go fairly low into the city, but adds a really nice drama to it. Uh, Tim Cooper, who is not here, he's teaching a workshop in San Francisco, took this shot a few nights ago. He posted it up on our Instagram feed, and I said, Tim, i got to put this into our presentation. This is another 
excellent example. And obviously, we all know where this is, San Francisco, shooting from Marin. Um, and um, again, the technology is available. This is a series of, I believe, what we, oh, here we go. Here's the information right there. So he shot this well, with 60 30 second shots. So here the lights are brighter from the cars going over the bridge, right? So he couldn't get really a four minute exposure, um, you know, without, you know, it's all about the balance. We want the lights, you know, the ambient lights of the cars and the, and the, and the lights from the bridge to not overwhelm the stars. You know, we want our stars to be bright as well. So he figured out his sort of base exposure which was 30 seconds at F4 at 200 ISO. And then on his tripod, he used an intervalometer and set that to take 60 consecutive 30 second shots here to make a 30 minute, the appropriate 30 minute exposure altogether. And then of course, you, he said he removed some of the, the uh, airplane trails, but he, liked, he did like sort of the busyness and the chaoticness, you know, of those ones just kind of coming out of there, so. Really, really cool shot, and you know, looking at seeing, you know, of, of, of really pushing this. This is a very unique shot. Night photography, we can't see this, right? We can't see this with our own eyes. We're lucky if we do see the stars in the cities. We can. There's there's four stars in New York City. <laughs> you know, the four of the brides, exactly, and, and, and sometimes a couple planets. We can see them occasionally with no moon, you know, but there are stars there, you know, and, but our eyes can't see this. But if we know the technology and if we have the creativity to do this, you can be creating images that are just jaw-dropping, right? That really make people go, wow, you know, and, and it really, and balancing all that, whether it's Milky Way, whether it's light painting, star trails, etc. So... Um, this is uh, a little bit information about me. This is uh, a little time lapse, another effective uh, way to capture the night. This is uh, Lance and I were in Iceland leading a workshop out there, and um, I wanted to take a picture of me taking a picture, you know, of the Aurora's because I was just so I, I did all I, I did a series of portraits. This was just one, another jaw dropping night where the Aurora's, as you can kind of tell here, there's so little blue sky there's so little sky the auroras just kind of took over the sky and i would never seen anything like it but then after a while after you kind of get come down from the high of just seeing them okay now how can i make a shot and i just love putting i took a picture of all of our students and took portraits of them out there and i just love putting that element in there and matt's going to talk a little bit more about adding that human element and how it kind of gives you know uh space and and it gives you know a, a whole that that whole human element to it. But that's, you know, Instagram, you can always, that's a, a great way to follow me and National Parks at Night. Those are our handles. Um, when I first came to New York, this was like in 2001, and this is shot with film. This was shot with a Mamiya C220 camera, four minutes, F4 with ISO 100 film. I believe this was Fuji Acros film. This was one of the first shots I took. I've, I've, I love bridges. You'll see that in my work. I love the Brooklyn Bridge. The Brooklyn Bridge took over the Golden Gate, you know, by a landslide, <laughs> I'll have to say. Um, and uh, this was one of the first shots I took. I loved it with the snow. And, and this must have been just a really quiet, quiet night um, there because I was able to get four minute exposures. You go out there now with the cars and the everything, you're barely able to get a minute exposure out there, you know. So this is a shot, again, uh, of, uh, of my wife Nancy you can see her right her face in the front and then she's also two more times in the distance um, and this was something I learned um, earlier on she was wearing black clothing I was popping her with a flash skin very reflective black uh, coat to keep her warm not so reflective you know but with film I needed to process it come back and make those adjustments from there but I love kind of going back and 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 so I went to go back to that spot um, what was it, like four years later, I believe it was, and this is the shot I got, you know, totally different, same location, I just walked 40 more feet to the end and looked down, you know, onto the oncoming traffic. Um, this was either a night before, you know, the tribute to lights or the night of the tribute lights, because they, they, if you're here a day or two earlier, they're always testing them, um, so you can capture that. Um, and again, this is, I think this is, okay, here's our exposure information right here. 
or right there. There we go. 15 seconds, actually. So 15 seconds, F14, 200 ISO. So much more than that. And you're getting sort of the vibrations of the cars moving. And that's the tricky thing with bridges. You get uh, often my tip is if you're actually on the bridge, you really pay attention to that the movement of it. Otherwise, staying if you're staying on the the beginning or the end of that sort of concrete foundation, you'll be able you'll be a little bit more secure. But bridges give you such great vantage points, and are the whole symbolism of a bridge is is just a, a wonderful way. Almost every city, you know, has one, whether it's a small little a little bridge like all the Venice bridges or these epic bridges um, like the uh, Brooklyn Bridge. The city moves and the city breathes. How can we capture that? Brooklyn Bridge from the other side, shooting and looking into the, you know, most people shoot it from Brooklyn and coming, looking at Manhattan because of the familiar skyline. But here I am, this is now from the, from Manhattan looking out to Brooklyn, capturing the moon in it as well, um, as well as then kind of getting the uh, Manhattan Bridge in the distance and the Williamsburg Bridge in the, in the far distance. I loved Again, the city breathes. Where do we see the movement of the city? Water, you know, sky, clouds. Think of all the all the things that move at night, and how can we, you know, how can we amplify that? You know, how can we kind of make that work to our advantage? So, the uh, data on this one: sixty seconds. F eleven two hundred. 60 seconds was just enough to kind of smooth out the water just enough um, without also retaining, you know, without blowing out any of the lights over there. This is single image, not HDR. And the city, it never sleeps, especially New York City. You know, the lights are always on. Another shot from the Manhattan side, looking now, not looking directly at Brooklyn, but looking up the bridges during the super moon. This was on, uh, I believe, a photo walk we did here at B&H, or if, we, if any of you were on this, we set up a big telephoto lens, um, and unfortunately, we had about two minutes, if that, you know, of, of, the, of the super moon peeping out of the cloud cover, you know, so I applaud everyone that came out that night, and just, we weathered through it. You never know with weather. I always go out. You, you might not get what you were looking for, but turn around, look to the side, there's maybe something else. If the, if the sky is not cooperating, look for a detail shot or something like this. But, you know, uh, this, one, this one was just, again, wonderful collecting the three bridges. You saw the three bridges before, but they were so far away. Now using, you know, a telephoto lens up to 370 millimeters. On, for this, I didn't even go zoom all the way because I love just the way that each one of the, the railings were kind of crisscrossing around in a half a second. Again, night photography is anywhere, you know, from a 30th of a second, really, to however many hours, you know, you want to play, um, especially with the city and the urban, that kind of stuff like that. We're not extending super long exposures. You know, we could be very well living in fractions of a second. Moving slightly north here, getting underneath the, um, the Manhattan Bridge. It's all about perspective, especially when you're trying to either interpret, reinterpret, or you know, capture or create a city, finding an a, a, a epic vantage point, getting up high, getting up low, or like letting that thing live right above you and kind of go, this is actually on a shoot, Lance, and you and I were, were on, and um, we were able to get access to right underneath that bridge. I knew I just wanted it to be lined up, and, um, and I love the, the way the clouds, I wasn't, you know, bummed out about the clouds because, okay, let's make a move, you know, 85 seconds, a minute and a half, you know, was just the right amount to give those clouds that sense of movement. Movement is emphasized even more when there's something solid, you know, in the, that's wrapping around it. So having that bridge just kind of be there and you have the water moving and kind of smoothing out and then you have the clouds giving that movement, it's almost like the bridge has wings here. To, onto another bridge in Portland, horrible weather night. It was raining um, this night, and um, this was a, an, an old shot. This is actually on a, a really old camera. This is on a point-and-shoot camera. I wasn't even, didn't even have a tripod 
Um, oh no, I had I definitely had a tripod for thirty seconds for sure. Yeah, so I had a little tripod with me, you know. Um, and this is the Steel Bridge in Portland, Oregon. I love the bridges in Portland. Very accessible. You can walk over all of them. And this one, I just love those concrete blocks. You know, that kind of those were what li lifts the bridge up for the you know up the middle part of the bridge up to so the boats can go by. Just so industrial. Um, this shot. Battling the sky and the clouds and all that, you know, creates that sodium vapor. You know, clouds are just bouncing those city lights back. That can be so difficult to work with um, and monochromatic until the trolley comes by, right? So we talk about car trails. Don't just stick to regular cars. I always, I love it when the buses and the trucks and the trolleys kind of go by. And now you got layers of car trail or of, of light trails and all different colors. So I kind of hung out here for half an hour, an hour, um, and, and used just a point and shoot camera, which we generally don't recommend point and shoot cameras for night photography, but actually the point and shoot cameras are getting better and better. Um, and for a quick shot like this, you know, keeping them the ISO low to make it the uh, noise, you know, at a very, very minimal to, to nothing, um, 30 seconds also, and then F8. So kind of playing to the sweet spot um, of everything here. But again, being at that, that perspective, car trails high, low, you know, from the ground view. Again, when you can get under things and give them more power. Mm -hmm. This is also in Portland. This is a water, a neighborhood water tower. You know, that looks like the Close Encounters, you know, spaceship kind of coming down. And it's just, it's a, it's a park, you know, so you can walk under it, this, that. And this is a, I believe this is a, a five minute exposure, F8 ISO 200. And this is a, you can, you can tell by just looking at the sky. The sky is blue, so there's lots of moon out there. Minimal stars, but I love that blue. And again, like what Lance was saying, playing the various colors against not only each other, but against the blue of the sky. I, you know, the black skies, no moon skies can be really, really tricky in city locations because it just becomes this negative space, you know, so for tonight, especially, we're going to really seize the night during the twilight hour. That's a key time to kind of shoot is during those that times when there's still light in there or if there's a moon out that's still keeping that the, the uh, sky bright. That's what helps us sort of really kind of capture and keep texture throughout the scene and not have darkness. Like this. Here's, Las, we, here's New York. New York, New York. <laughs> you know, Las Vegas. Um, but after twilight... And now the skies, you know, I, I tried to really minimize how much of the sky I'm putting into it and a lot of energy in here. I took this shot by finding the vantage point. Tim actually found this location and, and you know, when we got to this place, we're like, oh, this is a busy intersection. How can we get these car trails? And we saw that the Tropicana seemed to have a very high stairwell that kind of went out and we kind of just walked right in, bags, tripods, and went up the, and you can walk, just get off any floor you want and walk all the way to the end. And then there's like the, 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 the emergency exit that didn't sound an alarm, thankfully, you know? <laughs> but you, you had these wonderful vantage points, you know, of looking down, you know, upon the city. And, you know, if we were to look up, we would incorporate more of that black sky. And that's not what we want to do. We want to kind of minimize that. Um, and this one is a, almost a minute exposure. Um, F11, uh, ISO 200. I like to keep my ISOs, you know, low for, for that, that better image quality. When we get to those higher ISOs, 32, 64, and beyond, we start to see more grain in that. Fine for Milky Way stuff because the Milky Way is granular, but when there's lots of rich colors in city, I want to keep them kind of rich and smooth. Like, like I mentioned, stopping for twilight, you know, really... Uh, you live in a city, make sure you're taking advantage of twilight, the blue hour, you know, uh, right as the sun, as soon as the sun sets, usually here in New York, it usually lasts, you know, around 30 minutes or so. It depends on the time of the year, you know, but um, we, we get a lot, you know, if you're, and then if you go to someplace like Iceland or Alaska in the summertime, it's the forever twilight, the midnight sun, right? So the famous subway stop, right? And it's the subway's open, but just that green and blue just playing off each other. If that was black, it would be kind of boring. It's like, okay, yeah, there's 
there's a, yeah, the, the street light, but, but those two colors now emphasizing and amplifying the mood. Um, so shooting in that twilight, this is for a 15th of a second. This is just a grab me shot. You know, I probably just coming out of the subway at the right time and then stopping on that stairway and having, of course, you know, thousands of people, you know, go by me, you know, which that's a shot too, but uh, <laughs> if you hold still enough. Up in uh, Scotland, uh, the uh, Isle of Skye here. Um, and I noticed, you know, when we, we stayed right up at the hotel, up at the top there, and when I saw, you know, playing with any sort of, you know, bays and harbors, those could be tricky because too much movement, make, you know, the boats, you know, we don't want them moving too, too much because um, it just kind of distracts us out of the scene. But it was so calm and the water was just like a mirror pool, you know, and I was like, I got to go out. I got to go out during this twilight. You know, you can see, you know, to the west, it's still brighter uh, in the sky over to the left than to the right. You know, so this it's really, you know, just entering that blue hour. But I really love this, again, mirror effect during twilight, all the lights match up, right? So it makes our exposure much easier, you know? Yes, you will have to sometimes embrace HDR with city scenes if, you're, if we have such a wide gamut. But if we shoot during twilight, that instead of it being 14 levels of brightness, now it goes to about maybe six. And that's something that we, our cameras and our eyes can easily capture. So 15 seconds. Really the priority here was again, keeping an eye on those boats. I was clicking away, trying longer, shorter exposures, you know, to make sure that the boats weren't moving too much. And here's a perfect example, right? Same sort of shot. I took the one on the left first, you know, and that I just, this was playing with a lens baby to get that sort of that out of focus effect on it. Um, and the one on the left was, was shot. I loved it, it was great. But again, look at all of that black space and all that levels of like one, two, three in the darks, you know, it's dramatic, it's nice, but then look at the one on the right, which I went then redid the next year I was out in Vegas, different angle, incorporated more because I could. And that blue sky, everything's balanced and the colors are complementing and contrasting each other. And I'm still getting that sort of that, that zoomy lens baby, uh, you know, out of, out of focusness with it. So speaking of the lens baby, this is a, uh, I like, I like toys. <laughs> I'll admit it. I like toys. I like things that can push my visions along. And Lens Baby is one of the few uh, that I've been using since Lens Baby like 2.0. And it's this lens that doesn't really look like a lens. It's like a ball and socket design that you can, you know, kind of bend and twist around. And uh, you can put your your focus wherever you want it to be. And it's this typically a circular kind of focus and then defocuses around the edge. Really, really cool thing. I like playing with a lot of different lenses that can help me, again, see in a new way and, you know, interpret. This is their new one that's made for mirrorless cameras and it's called the Trio. A little bit easier to use, a little bit less of the effect. Um, this one, it, it is a, a turret system, so it has three different lens effects on it. It's got the sweet effect, it's got a twist effect, and it's got a velvet effect on it. So. Uh, I, I traveled to Iceland. Um, I had that one on my on my mirrorless camera a lot. It's light, simple, and again, it helps me when we have 16 people, 10 people, four people standing the same, shooting the same thing. Mine's going to look a little bit different. So utilizing the tools, you know, that we have to push it along. So here's again same same shot from Vegas, from uh, not now not from the trap, from now ground level, but shooting during twilight using the lens, baby and get really nailing that the you know if we looked at the other one the the uh, Statue of Liberty was a little hot in that so I really should have HDR that to kind of retain it this one again everything balances out you know really really nicely and in that lens baby what it does with these direct light sources it just turns them into wonderful like frisbees of light I like to call it tenth of a second This is the ferry building in San Francisco. I was at my brother's birthday party and it was it was elevated. So I was looking down at the ferry building. And again, unique way to again kind of capture that and again get that motion, get that kind of that zoom effect to it that kind of separates itself and balances the warm lights. I love I always love balancing that warm sodium light against the blue sky. That just to me that is like the best sort of color combination. 
And this is, I don't, I don't think I brought my tripod here. I just uh, took it at a 30th of a second. Pro tip, if you don't have a tripod, turn your camera into a burst mode. And then oftentimes you can fire off 10 shots, you know, 15 shots, 20, whatever, how many shots you want. The first two or three, you know, turn yourself into a tripod, you know, really hold your camera, put it against your eye, you know, and then, you know, the first two or three are gonna be kind of, you know, will have a little shake, but by the third or fourth one, they'll, you'll, you'll get something that's sharp. Usually you can do that from like a fifth of a second to a 30th of a second. You know, anything longer than that, you definitely need to set it down on something or use a tripod. This I just took, I was just visiting, um, this is another lens. I just, actually this is a Kickstarter lens I just got from Meyer Optic. It's, this is their, uh, well, their, their soap bubble bo bouquet mm -hmm. lens. And um, didn't get that effect, but it has this beautiful softness to it. Um, this is sort of the straight shot of it. Everything sort of in focus, but I love kind of what it's getting. It's doing with that sodium uh, light there. Um, everything's well retained. I'm catching the tail end of twilight here. It's a little bit richer, a little bit darker, uh, but everything still is balanced out. Um, this is a uh, 20th of a second. Believe now, this is always using a tripod for this 3200. But now, kind of everything doesn't need to be in focus. So I was like, you know, I. The, the, this lens is sort of famous for creating that sort of that that bubble, that really circular bouquet. Um, so I wanted to play with that. Similar exposure, and then I took it took it to the extreme, you know. And again, you know, playing with something dreamy, you know, and that kind of stuff. So all we see we see this this sort of the bouquet in cinema a lot, where they'll kind of do a a shot of a person. And the person will be sharp, but then the rest of the city or everything will be just be color behind them. So just think of that. So I don't, you know, this is an okay shot. I would like to have something in the foreground to kind of separate it. But this is a wonderful sort of background, you know. But I want, again, this is me kind of just first time with, the, with that lens and testing out what it can do and what it looks like. You know, so whenever you get those new toys, play with them, understand them, and then push them to their extremes. The detail shot. Kind of mentioned this just a bit before, but like when we're not getting that cloud, the clouds or the sky cooperating, or again, we don't always want a wide shot. You know, that's something I always have to tell myself. Usually, whenever I go to a national park, I'm always got my 1424 lens. Usually, it doesn't come off the camera. You know, so I have to bring another camera <laughs> that has another lens or whatever. But you know, but get looking for detail shots. You know, Matt kind of taught me this. He would travel a lot with his 7200 lens. I'm like, 7200? Why are you traveling with 7200 lens? No, you know, you're, you're just, you know, I, I just couldn't comprehend it. But I, I saw what he was getting, and, and then I was like, you know what? You're right. There's lots of little details that can help you tell that story. So this is, again, uh, you guessed it, another bridge. This is in Pittsburgh. You know, again, that, and again, getting in close, getting a detail of it, and then getting those, that bokeh colors behind it. detail shot from the High Line when it first opened you know there was kind of they were trying to figure out if you can have tripods or you're not you can have tripods as long as they're not you know uh, encroaching on the uh, traffic there uh, but this was just handheld with a 50 millimeter wide open and just getting the detail of the chair I love the blue you know I just love this blue color I was attracted to the color now how can I kind of play with the light I love this sort of little you know repeating spotlights there and again, that, that, those out of focus little bouquet bubbles in the distance. And then Lance mentioned weather. Weather is just another way and a reason to go out there and interpret that, the, the location. Rain is awesome. You know, obviously protect your gear, but rain just amplifies the reflections. You know, so this is just handheld San Francisco. I'm just walking around after an opening. Right, this is right next to the MoMA. Um, quarter of a second on burst rate at 1600. I had 30 to look at, looked at the one where the people were the sharpest, or a little bit of movement, and then the car placement, you know, when cars were coming in and out, you know, so don't, you know, don't, you know, really kind of, with night photography, this, this stuff, you know, the city stuff, right, you want to really collect a lot of information. You want to, you know, usually it's slow and meditative, and you know, out in the parks, 
but in the cities and stuff like that, we want to capture a lot of different because it's different as the cars move by. Every car, every frame is different. As the people walk by, everyone is going to change a little bit. So it's really best, again, either shoot in that burst or just collect a lot of shots so that you can kind of see which one plays. Waiting for those moments, too, um, is a big thing. Another of the... Uh, of our, our wonderful little uh, subway lights. Uh, again, this one kind of coming right out, had the camera, you know, brought it with me to work, and this had the confetti snow, you know. Snow, um, I, I, you know, it was, why was it confetti? Because I captured it at 15th of a second, it was coming down pretty quick and pretty thick, you know. If I would have captured this at, you know, four seconds, eight seconds, 10 seconds, you might not even see the snow. Right, so again, playing with time, that longest exposure maybe isn't the best one, you know? So I believe, and this was, yeah, this was just with my, the X-Pro, 15th of a second, 5.6. And I love the person kind of battling their way with their umbrella there too. And again, I took about 40 of these images, but this is the one where just everything played nicely. And for me, it's really all about reinterpreting city. How do you, you know, we travel, all, all, almost all of us travel, whether we go in upstate or someplace local, or we go to, you know, a different city in the United States, Europe, etc. And it's all about reinterpreting that city. How can I put my vision onto this city? I've lived in, I was born in San Francisco. I lived there for many years. Twin Peaks is probably one of the most popular places to shoot, to, uh, shoot the sunset. And this is along all the, you know, everyone is down at the scenic points. I shot it down there too, but when the sun went down, as often we'll find ourselves as night photographers, I was the last one there. I climbed up the hill to the top of the peak, looked at the other peak, and I knew that these, it was one way, so I knew I could get red one way and white the other way. And this one, I had to use a filter. This is uh, sometimes, you know, I could either stack the uh, car trails but for this one, I used a filter to extend my exposure. This is a 15 minute exposure. Um, and I took probably three of these, and this one was the best one. Because again, it's all about, with 15 minutes, there's only so much you can control, <laughs> right? You know, but I kind of could see the cars a little bit in the distance and said, okay, you know, and the later you wait in a place like this, the fewer the cars are gonna, are gonna come up. So still a little bit, this is, I think, at, we might be in astro twilight or something like that. You know, I don't, don't know what the moon phase was, or again, we're getting a lot of that lower light from just the light in the, uh, from, from San Francisco itself. Los Angeles, Los Angeles from the Griffith Observatory, shot wide, you know, again, detail shot, wide shot, medium shot, how many different ways. I just love that. I love the moon, again, pr keeping the moon in that. It's sort of like, it looks like that sort of, that beacon over, just watching over, making sure everyone's tucked in tonight, <laughs> whatever. But 30 seconds, I believe I just had a tabletop tripod or maybe I had a regular tripod. Um, but this was a night where they had this big Astro Fest out at the Griffin. There was all these telescopes out there and, uh, and I loved it. It was a big party out there, but I found this nice kind of quiet movement. How else does the city move? Put yourself into the movement. You know, this is back to Vegas. You know, putting the tripod on the people mover and then, you know, and, and, and taking the ride, you know. So this is a, a two and a half second shot. The longer ones, you know, were, were, were too much, were too chaotic. So again, it's about testing it and finding, you know, shooting at F-16. I, not, I usually don't, but it's bright lights, you know. And I had 40 or 80 of these ones to choose from, but finding the right ones where, you know, the lights from uh, what Caesars wasn't blown out and the, 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 the ribbons of kind of going through, you know, something from Star Wars or something like that in this one. But the cities also have quiet places, right? Central Park um, or, or Little Parks. This is North Park in Pittsburgh. I went shooting with my friend Tom and this is, uh, I think it says the Fountain of Youth on this little uh, on this little entrance way and uh, I had uh, my friend I, I, I took this picture it was good but then I needed to add the human element to it Tom showed sh shined his light there and about 10 bats came out of there <laughs> but uh, he was a brave one and, and, and stuck it out the data on that one four minutes for this one same park North Park P Pittsburgh that's 
a water tower, you know, that looks like a lighthouse. The moon shining through the glass of the top of the lighthouse and then choosing an exposure and, fa and facing south so that the star trails, you know, kind of look like beams or just shots of light kind of coming out. Seven minute exposure. South Beach, Florida, Miami, who would have thunk, you know? Um, inspired by other artists, Rothko, sculptures, any, all this kind of stuff. How can we bring that into it? I wanted to, you know, take a picture along the beach and I had to use a telephoto lens here. I'm using a 300 millimeter lens for two minutes and 5.6. Right to the right and right to the left of this are two like either buoys or ships, you know, that would have distracted. I want no, I didn't want any other lights in the scene. I wanted this to be just about shades of blue, right? And where is that, is, is the horizon line really even a horizon line or is it just another level of blue, right? So. This is really looking just at that, that white, that uh, the first white band is really just probably eight feet from my feet, you know, just the water that close. This is on a recent trip to, uh, to Cambridge, England and uh, shooting through the window pane. You know, this was a family trip. It wasn't really a photo trip, but I love the view from my room. And I just would like, as a voyeur looking outside, you know, I wanted to give that effect. And I love that street lamp there. I love that, so I was just drawn, you know, sort of like that moth to the light, and I just waited, I was taking pictures and pictures, and then this person walked in, and so that's it. That's, that's the human element that, that nails it, that amplifies it. Eighth of a second. Istanbul. Spotlight on the, on the, uh, the peanut guy, or I believe, or cashew guy, or, but I just love the cigarette in his mouth, and the smoke coming out. You know, from the from that, but then I loved it. It was a stage, right? This looks like a stage, right? And the spotlight is just on him, even though there's other actors kind of going on. And I waited for people to kind of create a little bit of of subtle depth to it. But there's the woman all the way in the back on her phone. You know, there's the security guard not caring about me. You know, which is awesome. Um, and uh, and then he's lit up perfectly, and and then taking that puff at the right moment. Handheld, sixtieth of a second just going out for a night walk. And the city parties. There's many events that happen in cities. I'm lucky enough, I try to go out to the Day of the Dead festivities in San Francisco every year. So getting in close, using flash, so sync, slow sync, lo low light, you know, kind of photography um, can kind of create, get right up with, you know, the dancers or, you know, the performers here, 15th of a second. But then I always, whenever you go, go on a parade, I always try to shoot the beginning or the end because there's either some, there's all that hype kind of at the beginning, but even better sometimes is ah, at the end, we did it, you know? And this was just a nice quiet place where everyone was kind of, you know, having their, their memorials for their loved ones. And then this was this little art project where people could, they had the, the, uh, the, the lines out where people could just write, write little notes to lost loved ones. And just, I just stood in front of these people and I loved him. I love that they're all looking different places, right? Handheld, eighth of a second on the burst. And fireworks, you know, fireworks are definitely a popular style of night photography and look great in cities. But how can we kind of take a different shot of the fireworks, right? So adding, you know, the meta. <laughs> or something, you know, or, or playing with time even more creative. But this is so I didn't plan on shooting the fireworks. Then we ended up here. I had my camera and it was just so funny. It's like I wasn't in the right location. You know, I, I didn't follow any of the rules you would for doing good, you know, uh, firework photography. But then I was just surrounded by hands coming up with iPhones or phones and stuff like that. So what do you do? You know, and it was interesting. And it was like, so now I'm just kind of basing my focus and exposure on the hands and making sure that sharp, you know, and then waiting for a big burst to kind of fill up, you know, the rest of the frame. Fifth of a second, handheld. There was no room to put a tripod down. I could use the person in front of me and to the right and to the left as the, as the tripod. And then I'm lucky enough that I get to, um, I've been I've been under and inside the, the tribute of lights, you know, for quite a few times. And this is what it looks like. These are what the lights are. Um, this is a 360 degree uh, picture flattened out. Um, 
And you can see I'm triggering it with my phone here. And there's some of our friends. I think Matt's here somewhere. Um, but I this is... I think that's me spinning around. Spinning around that red yeah. little... Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, how can we... And, and you know, I've... I've gone and shot this probably seven or eight years. And the first year was magical because you're just like, oh my God, I'm under the lights. I'm in the lights. I can walk inside out. You know, and you get all these just unique point perspectives and point of views. So every year I have to kind of challenge myself now. It's like, I want to go back. I love that experience. But how can I re-up it? How can I elevate it to another capture? So um, this is the Ricoh Theta S, 360 degrees for two seconds. It's on a tripod. Um, I'm triggering it. Did some portraits one year, for those of you who know our good friend Klaus, often a frequent uh, event spacer, um, and takes and has been on a lot of our workshops. There he is, underneath the lights. So did one year I did portraits, quarter of a second. And then this year was super fun. This year really opened it up. I, I took my camera on a tripod, and uh, I used a, a circular fisheye lens, and I, instead of I, I flattened the camera so it just looked directly up. So camera, tripod, so the lens is looking right up. Went, went in the middle of the lights and spun the camera around to create this circle of light. It's awesome. Loved it. Could, didn't see that, but playing with time. That's the magic, you know, of night photography. So this is four seconds. So I spun it around that I had to carefully spin it around. You break the rules, and then you kind of find out, then you finesse them. You know, so it was four, I, I like this one, this is probably my favorite, but then I did this, for four, instead of four seconds, I went to 15 seconds, and I stopped, sort of at, at the north, south, east, and west, and held it there for like two seconds. So I'd take the picture for two seconds, move it to the next quadrant, hold it for two seconds, move it to the next quadrant for two seconds, move it to the next quadrant for two seconds, and got this. <coughs> so cool. So this is, uh, again, looking perspective. This is from the Manhattan Bridge. Uh, I think these are what we call photographer holes. <laughs> Made and designed by photographers for photographers. <laughs> But there's a lot of these little uh, vantage points. So how again, how can we go out? Looking for getting on the bridge, looking for a vantage point on the traffic from you know, FDR. I like this, but uh, you know, it wasn't doing it for me 100%, so I kind of went through. Okay, so this is five seconds during twilight. So now I went through the hole, you know, and I like this, but it was still like, where's the most interesting part of this picture? Is the movement, the city moves. So get in there, right? There's the better composition. Let yourself play with it. Let yourself, you know, like oftentimes we start wide and then we move in and in because we look at the picture, we're studying the picture, and we're like, where's the most interesting point? Where are my eyes continuing to go? So get in there. 10 seconds, still catching twilight. Using, going through a small aperture and a smaller and, and a lower ISO so that I can push. I'm not using filters or this is not stacked. This is singular exposure. Looking down on Chinatown, still a little bit on the bridge right here. And then now this is just kind of playing and waiting for the right moment. Waiting, there's not much traffic here, but waiting for those right vehicles to kind of come in. So sometimes we'd wait for two minutes. Sometimes we wait for 30 seconds. Sometimes we'd be firing right away, right away, right away. This is a 20 second shot. Losing twilight now, you know, you can see sort of again, that a lot of the negative space up top. Where are we looking? We're looking at the streets. You know, I like, you know, I tried to frame it so that, you know, really tight to the top of that tower there, you know, because that's the last little bit of valid information that our eyes will want to linger on. Getting down to street view. So we went to, you know, to, to uh, Madison Square Park, and we thought it would be, the weather again was not cooperating, not interesting lights. This is sort of the idea I had, and then a bus went by, so, you know, this reminded me of the steel bridge image, but it's like, ah, I, I, it's not working for me, you know, so if it's not working for you, let go, you know, and look to what is working, look around the area. So I looked over here, this isn't really, a sh this is sort of just, I'm looking shot, 
This is not anything I'd really show except in this presentation. <laughs> but I love that building, right? And I'm like, okay, that's where that's what's interesting right now. So how can I how can I amplify that? I had a zoom lens. I like to, you know, I'm a prime guy most of the time, but I love shooting cities with a zoom because you never know what's gonna happen. And plus you can now zoom with your lens at night. This was my first attempt where I this was a uh, 10 second shot and I ended at one, I started wide and I ended at 135. But again, when you zoom, it's all about sort of where you start, where you end and how much you zoom. That wasn't, I like the idea of it, but I needed to finesse it. So then I played around with, with this one. I got to this location where I start, I, I kind of, I started tight, 10 seconds. I probably held it there for about four or five seconds and then slowly zoomed out to create that effect. I love the clock. I love the rest of the lights that are kind of now filling up that negative space, that dark space there. 10 seconds, F11. The city moves, people. Let's seize it. All right. Thanks, Gabe. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Matt. How you doing? Let's all raise our arms up. Shake them around a little bit. All right, leave to the right. Right, 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 right. Leave to the right. Wait, what's the right? No, it's not that. Wait, who's right? Okay. Do the Octopus. Wave. Do the right. octopus. <laughs> Warm up a little bit. It's getting a little chilly in here, right? All right. Here we go. Here we go. I have been studying the nocturnal habits of urban and suburban humans <laughs> for over two decades. And I, I want to share what I've discovered with you. Uh, Got to make sure I have that uh, NPR voice on. <laughs> So what have we discovered? Well, there are people out in the wilderness that stand in the dark. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I, I, I want to be clear. I did not always seek the wilderness. Um, I started my night photography career in suburbia. I grew up in western New Jersey, uh, the second half of my youth. And I had that weird blend of rural and suburban there. And I had that yearning that a, a country kid has to to know the city, right? So I, I, I was in a place where you required a car to get around and there was no public transportation. So I, I knew what it was like to be near darkness, but not total darkness. Um, but I, I did grow up. I, I, you know, when we first start out shooting, we also kind of don't, we might not always be the most gregarious of people like Gabe. <laughs> uh, exactly. So. Uh, I, I didn't start shooting people. I started shooting objects and things and things that would stand still and not judge me <laughs> for having a camera. Right. <laughs> so uh, I, I would be shooting places and things. And um, this is uh, this is Colchester in, in the UK. And I, I started. I, I realized I was drawn towards like gravestones and monuments and you know the things we do as kids but I realized that I was I was in effect shooting people it was just representations of people monuments to people art of people it's just like the, the front side and the back side of the same monument and shot with a, a Lomo Petzval lens which is one of those oddball lenses with crazy bouquet what's happening here is it, that's not, that's an effect of the lens and the light reacting within the optics. And playing with that, it happened here again. And that's further down on the same monument, but three different views of the same place. And I realized that I, as I was doing this, I, I like photographing people, but I also like the lines. So there's certain compositions that I'm drawn to that I photograph over and over, strong lines. But then I found that there are people, but I didn't approach them. <laughs> Stay your distance. And I stayed my distance <laughs> from them, and this I, I this was a long time ago. I, I stood with my my D seven hundred and just went click 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 and spun around in a circle, and then I stitched it badly on purpose because I liked the truncation of what was happening there, and I I liked the the filminess of it. I know you can just get a, a camera like a Fuji that has like the built in panorama and go. Yeah, and it builds it right in the camera for you now. And you can have it cut out for you on purpose. But I did this manually. 
and this started in New York City. So I said I was a country mouse. I'm a city mouse now. Uh, it's, my heart is still in the country, even though my body's in the city. Uh, and and this is where I shot as I started to really like cut my teeth on what I believe night photography is. So self-portraiture with the creeper in the background, right? <laughs> when you're at a bar, you know, with your newly converted infrared camera, but you're still looking for things, right? And then you're outside the bar, what? and you, you see things what? like this happening. <laughs> and then this is a guy playing a video game in the bar next door. And then, and then you're like, well, you know, next to that is this, and then there's this. Wait a second. Then this is the friend, my cousin, I was with. I said, "Would you mind looking up at it real quick?" So we created that scene, and they had no idea it was happening. <laughs> but this is all happening at night. I don't shoot during the daytime. I only take pictures at night. I don't know why. I can't explain it, but that's just what I do. So, so it taking pictures of people and their habits and creating these stories at night is totally possible wherever you are. Especially, like Gabe said, hanging out with like-minded people. Going out and shooting with your friends. Recognize this bridge, right? Recognize this place. <coughs> Might be there later. Um, we have fun shooting and saying, all right, we're going to do this. Uh, let's do fun things, right? Pull out the flash. I brought, back then, I brought a <coughs> Profoto Pro 7B <laughs> with me. I brought a 30-pound flash <laughs> with a head and a magnum reflector and like a grid and a light stand to do stuff like this just so that we could have fun and more fun and we all had cameras and and then I got serious and I turned around and I'm like all right I'm still going to take pictures of the city but I like I like context there's there is a beauty to just the works of man but putting man in with his works is also beautiful so showing the scene with people being there became something that I did unconsciously. I thought I, I didn't know it was a, a pursuit of mine. I was just making photographs at the time, and then things like this would happen. I had gotten uh, my first 85 millimeter lens. It was an 85 1.4. It was a Vivitar, and the aperture got stuck open at 1.4. <laughs> I didn't care because I could just shoot. I could drink light like I was sipping, to like, <laughs> you know, like, and I'd get moments like this with people with their their mobile phones on their face, and I'm like, oh, I just said mobile phone like an old person. Um, <laughs> their smartphone or whatever, their, their phone, whatever. So it is still a mobile phone. Thank you. Thank you for supporting me. But I, I found that I was, after I saw photographs like this, and I, w I wanted more of it, so... I started to deliberately choose to find people in their landscape instead of subtracting them and saying, I'll wait for them to leave, <laughs> right? Then we do that, right? So even when I'm scouting, when I'm scouting for a location for my art projects, I look for moments to happen. And I waited for this mini to go by and I hit it with my flash. <laughs> and there was this big uh, installation going on behind and I started to realize that there's a lot of art that happens in the city too, projection. So why not hijack other people's art? So this projection festival going on. And this was a test shot before I did something even more artistic, which I'm not allowed to show in B&H. So, <laughs> so this, is, this is this and that's that, moving on. And then this is out in near Gowanus. I guess there's a Whole Foods to the right of this right now. Yep. Um, again, my favorite picture from the whole night has a person in it. There's a pattern happening here. There's a pattern that I started to notice. And again, more people, more people all over. And I guess most of us who live in New York City have taken this photograph, right? It's still at night, okay? <laughs> right? And, and in my hood in Astoria, you know, just, just walking around. And sometimes people are bred. I just want to point that out. <laughs> Gluten. 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 Right. Gluten. This is this is the doughboy, but you know he got into a mess. He's, he's very dirty. So, but there's again like Gabe. I love bad weather. I, I think bad weather weather makes for great photography, and I'm drawn to it because people in bad weather is great. And you know, statues get capes 
and stuff like that happens too. <coughs> so we saw that picture there, and it's all about finding more people in their landscape. And then typography is a big thing in the city. There's, we are inundated with advertising. So strategically finding window displays that have messages that you want to find other things happening in, it happens even better at night because all of these displays are dressed and bathed in light. So why not make some silhouettes and make some other things and follow your heart? Ha <laughs> see what I did there? <laughs> this is like, you've got people staring at things and then people doing their things. And the message goes on and on. And I, I, I love water and I'm drawn to water like Gabe's drawn to bridges. And I, I, this is down actually north of Buenos Aires. Um, and I, I'm always drawn to the water and its movement and the light and people in the city is doing their thing. And this is, this is a film picture. I got kicked out of Barcade for doing this. <laughs> I had a Mamiya 7, and this is like a, an eight minute exposure. After eight minutes, they're like, hey, you, out of here. So, but at least I got the picture, and that's Gabe playing Tapper, so, yes. Not for eight minutes. <laughs> Not for eight minutes. We might, have, yeah, we, might have, we might have cycled through a couple times, but, but Gantry Park is another place to find people in their elements. But over time, as we find out with night photography, colors will record in ways that we can't comprehend. Our eyes are very sensitive and beautiful instruments. However, they can't record time like a sensor can. And color does wonderful things over time, especially when it's moving against the clouds. I had no idea that that night there was so much moisture in the air that all this uplighting from the skyscrapers was creating pillars of light. And that I liked because there was this pool of radiance over this group of people picnicking. So I found that there was, there was something echoing each other there. There was, there was a communication with the light and the people in the sky. Um, here's my fireworks photograph. <laughs> people watching fireworks nice. just a different view this is in Astoria Park at the at the pool there um, and then I even did it with an 8x10 one year I took a picture of people watching the fireworks with an 8x10 camera and that was fun and of course there's cell phones in the picture too it's a part of our reality embrace it right it's both a light source and it's an act and it's a part of our culture uh, so I find ways to to make it part of the, the story that I want to tell. And then Gabe said, <laughs> you know what, you're taking pictures of people. Why don't you actually go talk to somebody? Why don't you go ask, tell them to do things instead of just being a creeper, you know, and standing <laughs> off to the side. So I said, Gabe, you're right. So I started to approach people like this guy in Nashville. And it's just walking around. To, whenever I go on road trips, kind of like Gabe, I do, I go to bed later because I'll walk for 30 minutes or an hour with my tripod and take pictures. So this guy was just guarding a construction site. Walked up to him, shook his hand, said, hi, my name is Matt. I'm a night photographer. Do you mind if I take a portrait? He goes, ah, oh, go ahead, man. So we did, you know? <laughs> and it happened more and more. And I'm fortunate enough <coughs> to hang out with Gabe a lot, meaning that I get to attend the Tribute and Light uh, focusing also. Uh, so I do my portraiture thing with, with our friends uh, that attend this. And I, again, like challenging myself like Gabe, what do I do with this opportunity to keep it fresh? Bring Mabel. Bring Mabel. <laughs> my lovely wife, Mabel. Yeah. <laughs> and, and there's Klaus again. And, and finding ways to take pictures of our friends doing what they love too, because we do that. And light is the defining factor. And sometimes I ask myself, when I'm using light, am I weird? Yes. <laughs> we'll get to that in a second. <laughs> this was uh, a, two, a three light source photograph. It was down in uh, the panhandle of Florida on a road trip. And my, fr <laughs> my friend said, hey, I want to make uh, something that's um, oddly some symbolic in the sand. And I said, sure. Like, I've got... Uh, we were playing with um, modeling wire and fuses and other things in like the back country. So I, I had some of that fuse left over. So we made this uh, sand angel and had him lay in there 
and took a flashlight and scraped it over his forehead that way and had him get out and then just lit the, the fuse. And, you know, it was spring break, so it took him a while to catch on to what we were doing. Uh, and then I got this, this crazy photograph of uh, this angel in the sand. And the answer is yes, I'm weird. So uh, this is uh, when I lived up in Dobbs Ferry. Um, this is my only portrait so far to date. I'll have many more in my life of me with lightning. And this has been a, a goal of mine since I was a child when I got my first camera. I love lightning. Like I love bad weather. So how do I take a picture of me, myself with lightning? Safely is the answer. <laughs> Safely. Do it in a place where you can see the cells far away. So, you know, you know how storms work, you know, they're usually in a diagonal and they move across this way. That's north. So the next storm to hit us was 20 minutes away. I knew I was safe. So after I started doing these things that were more deliberate, you saw me walking through this, you can see the pattern where I'm, I'm starting to say, I'm going to tell stories. I'm going to ask people to do things. I'm going to make up stories. I spent some time in Denver uh, with my road trip buddy and right across the road from a place that we, we went to go shopping, there's this beetle place where they restored beetles and they had these awesome old bugs. And we asked them and it only cost uh, two pizzas and a bottle of whiskey. <laughs> <laughs> Access to the beetles that they had on the lot for like two hours to do a shoot. Because my friend had a three piece tux with him, why I don't know. And, and we got this outfit for our friend, uh, that's also in the picture. And we said, let's start just telling stories. So I borrowed two battery powered um, mono lights and we just started shooting after dark and making these stories and making these stories. And we had the sledgehammer for another thing. <laughs> yeah, you're weird, man. <laughs> we had the sledgehammer for another thing, but it was specific. Well, like, there was an old typewriter that we wanted to smash. So, so that was for that. And they, playing with it and changing the roles of the people that are inside of this. But all of this happens at night where I could have, I felt like I had more control over the story. I can control how much light was in the right place at the right time and blur things if I wanted to or get crazy skies, you know, who hasn't seen the James Bond posters, you know, or, you know, like, and then switching the roles, you know, switching the roles and seeing what happens, you know, and, and playing with that. But it all comes back to people in their environment and then having the courage to say, I want to make something with you. Will you participate? That was on the high line early when, when it opened up, playing with tripods. Got kicked out this night, too, um, because I had a flash with me that was on a stand. Uh, I have uh, one of my other things is I'm a cut paper artist. <coughs> and I, I make this ma these masks. And I was early on in before I had this major project that I worked on, I was like, how am I gonna start working on the technical side of this? I'm like, well, how about I bring a mask with me to the High Line and ask people if they'll wear it. I'm gonna take a poll. Raise your hand if you think, we'll do this in order. <laughs> One group or the other is more likely to say yes to wearing a mask if a stranger asked you. Um, native New Yorkers, visitors to New York. You guys were right. Not one New Yorker said yes to me. I was like, hey, I'm doing, a, I'm doing a photo project. All I want to do is take a picture of you here on the High Line. Would you mind putting this mask on for a moment? Just kept walking. Everybody who was here on vacation said yes. They're like, oh, that's a great idea. I'd love to do that. Sure. So I have all these people that I'll probably never meet again in my life. And these great portraits of them. It's, yeah, right, right. And then some people were even more willing, you know. <laughs> and this, yeah. And, and then, like, and then I realized that one of the things I've loved the most, by the way, most of these images I've never shown in public. So I'm, I'm sharing with you guys for the first time today some things that, that have, are part of the journey as I was going back and talking about how people relate with my night photography. This is one of my favorite shots where I really started to come together with understanding adding different light sources together and deliberately ghosting people. Uh, because there's, I have enough for you to tell there's a person there, but enough 
of the landscape behind them showing. And then I started to make that a feature of all of my photography, deliberately choosing transparency in a person during a night portrait and deliberately choosing light sources. Now this one has two light sources. There's a hard spot on the flash from left. And then Gabe, I believe this was you, fired a flash behind me to put my shadow on the post. Yep. That's right there. So I'm in the photograph too, yay. <laughs> But as, it, as the projects grew, I started to make the lighting look a little bit more natural. Um, and then, of course, things got surreal. That's just part of my process. And things got more surreal. Uh, but these, these, I often combine many light sources now when I do night portraiture, where it's ambient plus flash plus flashlight. So I'm balancing three different light volumes at the same time like like on a mixing board uh, and doing things like this where I can control all of them simultaneously and they end up telling stories like at my latest workshop where I taught uh, night portraiture up in the Catskills with something like this where we have ambient plus flash plus flashlight plus a little Luxley viola which makes all the colors in the world so uh, this is this is the end of the the journey 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 where I'm talking about this um, But I wanted to I wanted to share with you all of these habits not only of other people But of the evolution of my habits, which is still going in other directions, and I, I just want to say um, This I do on the side of on the side, you know, like <laughs> all of us are doing the, what we do with national parks at night for a reason uh, we love making night photography in this particular environment. But that doesn't mean that we don't do other things that we bring back into our craft that inform what we do. And the five of us all have different pursuits and passions. Uh, and I think it's a hallmark of what we do. Um, I just, uh, I'm not trying to win a, a, an argument here, but I think I'm the weirdest of the bunch. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, but they perhaps only because I, 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 I'm, I'm, I don't know. I like, I like complicated. So that's what it is. I like uh, and I, I, I can't find it. I looked for it over and over so I could give proper attribu attribution here. I believe this was a sign off on a, on an email from somebody who's a Ted talk speaker, but this is one of the best quotes I've read in the last year and a half. You can only connect the dots you collect. I'm going to expand on it for a second. It, it feels, it, I'm glad it feels obvious to many of you, but if you only use flashlights and you never try water canteens, you'll never be able to understand how they work together, right? But they do work together somehow. I just haven't figured it out yet. <laughs> they, I, I think it's important for you to pursue all of your passions. Uh, and to not judge them as separate, to allow them to bleed into each other. Uh, because without that, what we're doing here would not have been born. Uh, we wouldn't have been invited to speak to you guys about what we're passionate about or share our craft with you or our inspiration. So I charge you as listeners, watchers, attendees, thank you very much, uh, to go collect some more dots. All right, we finished. We did it. We did it. Wow. Hey, thank you. Thank you.